Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Now You Know and the Disruptive Investing Channel. We've got with us Marcus Lee, who is the founder and CEO of Eli, which is an electric vehicle startup. Thanks so much for joining us, Marcus. Thanks for having me. So Elon Musk said that starting an electric car company is probably one of the hardest things he's ever done. And this guy has also landed rockets. So uh, why are you starting an electric car company? Well, he's probably right about it. Um, I think when I started it, my background is in architecture and I was really looking at this problem from sort of an urban design perspective. So I guess very different from um, a lot of other automakers who's trying to build a car. Um, what I'm trying to do is trying to rethink what a car can be, not in the sense, in the technical sense of being faster and bigger and more technolog technologically more advanced, but more thinking about how, you know, cars needs to be redesigned to better serve urban trips and what a car would be if we just start from scratch and just design something that makes sense for cities. So what makes the Eli Zero, and we're seeing a picture of it here on the screen now, uh, unique to the market? I mean, what is its use case? It might surprise you, but in US cities today, almost half of our urban trips are in the three miles. So conventional cars are generally designed for long distance trips on highway and people are very focused on acceleration and that kind of stuff. So um, Eli is more focused on being compact, efficient, clean and affordable. And uh, we're focusing on attributes that makes daily short trips convenient and fun and a scale that can actually reduce emission and congestion in cities and communities. Um, so the Eli Zero is designed in the U.S. to fit in the NEV standard. Can you explain to our viewers what the NEV standard is? Yeah, sure. Um, so NEV is short for neighborhood electric vehicles. And it's actually a very special category of vehicle that's sort of in between a car and a um, sort of a scooter or a uh, motorbike. And um, it's something people are probably more familiar with uh, street legal golf carts. And so th these are the type of golf carts that fit into the NEV standard that are um, have the seat belts and all the safety, uh, uh, safety accessories that is able to be allowed to go on public roads, um, but a uh, limited use, use case, but they are allowed to go on roads that has a speed limit of less than um, 45 in most states. Uh, but we think, we, we think these, uh, this category is fantastic. It has potential to become the sort of the iPad of cars, meaning it's a, um, if conventional cars were laptops, it's a, a, you know, these kind of NEVs can be, um, uh, you know, uh, perfect for short, shorter trips, but they can have the potential to cover more than 75% of urban trips which is a segment that is for short trips under 10 miles. Now in Europe, um, it, I heard that the Zero will work, uh, basically they have a standard for it already. Can you explain how it would work in Europe? Yeah, in Europe, um, the, uh, the cars can go on public uh, roads, urban streets, and it doesn't have the same kind of requirement as uh, US for speed limit for the roads, but it has a, um, but the cars has to be under 45 kilometers per hour. So that's the standard for uh, Europe. And in Europe, actually, these kind of cars existed uh, for a much longer time than in, in the US, this category specifically. It's called light quadricycle. And I guess that's part of the reason is because um, the European streets are a lot narrower and people are much more familiar with this type of vehicles like, um, well, um, like uh, Fiat E500 and smart car. And these are vehicles that came out of, from New Europe. And I think uh, people are more familiar with this category of smaller cars. Now we uh, love to cover new EVs on the show. And one of the things we try and share with our viewers are the stats. And a lot of times we'll be talking about zero to 60 times. Now yeah. with the zero, that's not important, but can you tell us some of the stats of the zero, like the range and so forth? Yeah, so the range for Eli, uh, the European version is it can go up to 100 uh, kilo, kilometers uh, for the range. And so around 70 miles um, for the US version. Uh, and the speed, of course, by regulation, it has to be capped to be under 25 mile per hour for the US version and 45 kilometer per hour in Europe. Um, how about cargo space and what it can hold? So can this uh, carry two passengers? 
Yeah, uh, Eli Duro is a two-seater, and the reason for that is majority of times um, cars are driven by under one and a half person. So I think the average for uh, car occupancy is actually one and a half person. So um, we designed Eli Duro to be as compact as possible. So uh, it's really designed for a lot of urban dwellers or people living in uh, communities that perhaps some some of them want Eli Duro as their first vehicle uh, in cities, and some people want it as a sort of a second car in um, suburban communities to just get around with. So it's really not to compete with larger cars. Just like going back to the iPad analogy, you know, iPad is not there to compete with laptops, but it has its own use case. Uh, we believe when people first see these kind of vehicles, they will be surprised at how versatile it is and can take a lot of these uh, loads for uh, going on short trips, going to yoga classes or going to um, grab a Starbucks uh, nearby and going to a local library and that kind of use case. Now, obviously it has a fully enclosed cabin. Does it have any kind of heating or cooling system? Yeah, yeah it has both heating and cooling. And so um, it's, uh, and I think one of the, the selling point for Eli Duro and people would think it's really interesting is the fact that it has three to 10 times more energy efficiency compared to a conventional compact car, even compared with electric, uh, electric smart, for example. I think it's um, twice more energy efficient than a smart car. Yeah. And, and the, actually the reason for that is because the car being very compact it requires uh, less uh, fewer battery, and uh, battery is actually one of the components that's super heavy, and, and half of the energy of a conventional, for example, Tesla goes to powering its own battery. So uh, for having a smaller car purpose-built for short distances, it's actually ideal for uh, from an energy uh, efficiency perspective. Now, what's the price point that you're aiming at for the Eli Zero? Um, the Eli Zero is uh, in the U.S. is starting at uh, 12,500 uh, U.S. dollars and in Europe at 11,000 euros. Um, and that's sort of ha half the cost of a conventional car. So the Eli is capped at 25 miles an hour, but does that prevent it from going on uh, streets with other cars or, or specifically streets that are, have a speed limit over 25? So Eli and this category of vehicles, uh, NEVs can operate on um, roadways have, with a speed limit of 35 mile per hour or less. And in some states, it's a little higher, but in general, it's 35 miles per hour. And Eli Duro itself has a speed limit of 25 miles per hour or 45 kilometers per hour in Europe. Okay, so to kind of put this in yeah. perspective then for a lot of our viewers in America who are used to just getting in their car and going at whatever speed they want, um, if you're yeah. driving around your neighborhood just to go get a coffee or to pick up the kids at school, uh, you could drive on your typical back roads in America to go get them, and that would be fine to do in the zero. Yeah, it can actually cross a road with higher speed limit, but it cannot drive on it. So um, I think most people in the States would think, you know, that's a pretty uh, low speed limit. But um, for a lot of cities and a lot of suburbs, it actually uh, surprisingly covers a, a, a pretty wide range of area. For example, in New York, more than 90 percent of the roads in New York uh, have a speed limit of under 35 mile per hour. And I just want to picture a world, let's fast forward five years or 10 years, where more more cars yeah. look like the zero. It would be a pretty fun world to live in, I think, because it would be a whole lot safer. Cars wouldn't be speeding by incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. And yet everyone would be getting to where they need to go anyway, because the distances are so short and it would be clean and quiet. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's exactly our goal is to, to move toward that kind of um, cities and, and, and the world is a lot of people think from an individual perspective that you know it seems to to be beneficial for everyone if everyone have a suv or a big big car their own but collectively it's actually the other way counterintuitive quite counterintuitively it's the other way around you know more people have cars the more highways need to be built it's worse for communities it's worse for getting around in short distance, which is actually the majority of trips uh, for people in, in, in a lot of places. 
So if you think about um, European cities, um, they are designed quite smartly. They intentionally excluded larger cars or discouraged people from driving these cars. Um, and they are actually much more efficient at getting around where cities that are more highway dependent and car dependent, it's actually make livelihood much worse just because you have to get into a car everywhere you go and you always have to to go on highway even to a local market. And I mean, speaking of fitting in, Eli is a smaller vehicle. So if you wanted to build, you know, specific infrastructure for neighborhood electric vehicles or, you know, micro mobility, as you're talking about, those roads could be smaller if they were specifically designed for them. Um, are there any examples yeah. of places where people have taken NEVs uh, like and actually built infrastructure for them? A lot of people don't know, but there are communities in the U.S. that are powered by golf carts instead of um, big SUVs or passenger uh, sedans. So in Peachtree City, for example, uh, it's a small town in Georgia, and, but there are you know tens of thousands of golf carts, and people love driving them around. And because people you know start adopting these kind of uh, really versatile way of getting around, um, you know uh, the streets are actually becoming more friendly towards these vehicles, and um, the city is becoming more uh, adaptive to the needs to of people who drive these vehicles so i think that's a i think petrius city for example is a perfect uh, is a perfect case study for uh for a town that sort of grow into a golf car community but hopefully in the future micro ev communities and we think this kind of example can really um, be adapted to many different towns and cities and make cities more livable now, we talk to um, and we see a lot of new startup electric uh, vehicle companies. And one of the things that usually turns us off is that they've got these wonderful CGI renderings of their vehicles and they tell us they're going to come out yeah. any day now. And then we're like, yeah, I don't think so. And then they don't. Uh, what I was intrigued about with your company is that you don't just have CGI renderings. You have actual prototypes that you've been testing. So can you tell me how have you been able to do what most of these startups don't seem to be able to do, which is uh, go from the drawing board to a physical vehicle way faster than I've seen before. Yeah, that's actually a really great question, Doc, because looking around, there's enough ideas and concept and renderings. And uh, uh, even in this product category, you know, every, uh, every once in a while, there's these design or concept for future cities featuring these tiny small cars driving around and you see it in movies as well but i think the difficult part is actually uh, the behind the scene the supply chain and the engineering and the material science behind those vehicles to make it actually commercially viable um, and also you know have a product that people actually want to drive and at a price point that people can afford so that's something that um, we focus a lot at Eli, is that we really want to uh, build a vehicle that's not just an idea, but also have it on the streets. And because at the end of the day, you know, what we're trying to build is not a super car. We are trying to build a people's car to something that, that's so friendly and easy to drive and so versatile and affordable that people actually want to buy it and think it actually makes sense for a lot of use cases. The behind the scene effort is really in uh, working out the supply chain and the engineering perspective and have that really fit into the price point and fit into how you design a structure in a way that even in small batches that these vehicles can be commercially viable. And those things are actually really, really difficult with car manufacturing. And that's exactly what Elon Musk said about why it's so difficult. It's not making it stylish or making just an electric car, but I think that's what's so brilliant, brilliantly done by Tesla is that they're able to scale up their, not just um, the a technological perspective and technological sides of things, but also their supply chain and their cars engineering and all that coming together to fit into a commercially viable picture. So that's something that we spend actually more time on than the, making the car looks cool 
and you know, um, thankfully that a lot of our customers think it looks cool, but we actually spend more times making it commercially viable. And in terms of engineering, that we make it actually manufacturable. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of American or European companies have a hard time partnering、um, with Chinese companies, which are really good at this level of manufacturing. But there's a cultural and language barrier. There's a distance barrier.、Um, tell us about how you were able to navigate that. I mean, because you're in China right now, right? You're in Beijing. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, as a American, we are an American company. And we're based in LA, and we're part of the Los Angeles clean tech incubator. But what we found very difficult to to build these vehicles. The reason why that you see this category kind of stuck in the era of golf carts in US is because there isn't really a supply chain of these micro EVs supporting these vehicles. It's just for the same reason. It's really difficult to、mm, build. Uh, attractive e-bikes and、uh, attractive scooters in the states. That、um, I think the supply chain infrastructure, unfortunately, isn't available in the U.S.、Um, and it really takes for a startup like us to survive. It it's really takes a, a lot of、um, global supply chain perspective to in order to make sure that the vehicle can be done at a small scale. So we have a. Engineering team, as well as a supply chain team in in China, based in Beijing,、uh, and I've been in Beijing. Sort of、um, generally, I'm back and forth. But this year, you know, with the COVID situation, I've been in Beijing for almost the whole year. But fortunately, I'm able to work on the manufacturing side of things,、um, and that's、uh, actually going really well. And we're going into、uh, production in December. So we've been building sample vehicles and shipping them to Europe,、uh, which is our entry market. Shipping them to our European distributors, and that's、uh, you know that's all done thanks to、um, our supply chain team here. That's able to put everything together. Now, a lot of our viewers right now watching are looking for potential investments.、Uh, they're constantly contacting us and saying, like,、uh, "What company should I invest in besides Tesla?"、Um, and、yeah. be interesting for them to note that you are a startup, but Uh, there is a way to invest in your company. Can you explain how that works? Yeah,、uh, we are actually、um, launched. We have launched a startup engine, sort of a regulation CF crowd,、uh, equity crowdfunding program on startengine.com.、Um, so you can go to startengine.com/eli to check it out. And we are raising through convertible notes on、um, startup engine, and it's also. We think it's a great way to reach out to the community because you know, as we were building these vehicles, people saw the car and they really love it. And some people were asking about, you know, is there a way to participate in in the company's success? And we really want to foster a community of supporters to not just、uh, become our investors and grow as the company, but also to become our adv- advocates. And and it really takes、um, a, a strong community to be able to push these products to have people accept them, and but we think the potential is enormous for not just commercially but in terms of the impact to how people travel. So I think it's an exciting、uh, thing for us to to test out. And so far, we've not been promoting this much because we have to focus all our bandwidth on building the car. But you can see on Start Engine that we've been making a lot of progress. We've been updating people, and and we've we've got a lot of really good responses. And there's a lot of cool perks on there too if people want to invest early.、Um, for a lot of new investors who haven't heard of crowdfunding or kind of wary of it,、um, the cool thing about this is that the the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, in 2012、uh, made a new Change in the law because so many people were clamoring to get in on early startups. They're like, "Why did only rich people get to do this?"、Um, and so, yeah, now even yeah. you know, no matter what your income, I see on your、uh, start engine that it's a very low minimum investment if you want to try it.、Um, and the SEC has basically said that even if you earn under a hundred thousand, you can still get in on something like this. But I know that a lot of people watching are probably like, "Okay, but what's a convertible note?" Can you just kind of walk them through that a little bit? How does that work? Yeah, sure. So convertible notes is actually a both. Uh, a hybrid of equity and、uh, loan that converts later into、uh, a stock at a、um, at a predetermined term, but the pricing of the stock is not 
um, defined at the moment, but uh, but is actually calculated uh, from the next round of the equity investment. So that is very beneficial for investors in in different ways, but mostly just they don't have to set on a a predetermined price, but um, their price comes at a discount of the next round of investment. Um, And at startengine.com, our current uh, uh, fundraising is uh, termed at a $18 million valuation cap at a 20% discount rate. And so uh, you can go on to the website to find out more. But in general, I think convertible notes is a great way for a lot of institutional investors to get um, into startups without having to figure out uh, uh, a price at at that very moment at a gross uh, stage startup and might be um, pay a, paying a higher price, but that price is actually comes at a discount of the next round of investment. I thought a fun thing to do um, would be to decide at the end of this interview whether Jesse and I will invest in Eli. Uh, we've done this before. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, one of the biggest considerations we make when we're talking about a company, first we look at the product or service they're making, but I think even bigger than yeah. that for me is the founder and the CEO of the company because they're the ones who are going to be Mm -hmm. leading that vision forward. So I guess I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. What I know about you so far is that uh, you studied architecture in New York City. Um, Can you tell us a bit more about like how you got interested in doing this, uh, how your journey has been and what your vision is for the future of the company? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I my background is architect. I studied architecture in New York uh, at Cooper Union downtown New York and sort of it was at that time I was really interested in both urban planning and having to just travel around in New York I was thinking about my own options in the future what kind of car you know I want to I want to have in cities like New York and so that really got me thinking but you know I it was a couple of things coming together and my family also has a is also a distributor of machineries like John Deere and uh, and they also distribute golf carts and golf course machineries uh, and they have a pretty good share in the Chinese golf market for golf machineries so I used to go to these golf conferences with my my family with my dad and checking out um, these uh, these products and I was so surprised to see something like um, as humble as a golf car being loved by a lot of communities. I think that's part of the inspiration. And also I, you know, when I was starting up Eli, I really wanted to, to contribute, not just to create a different car, not just create a, another car for the world, but also to potentially, you know, build something that can change how people travel, how people move. And so the goal of Eli is, has not never been just a product but about the fact that the possibility behind the product where it can potentially change the way communities are organized, the cities are organized and change how people, um, where people go and how people travel. And I think that's where the beauty of mobility is not the product, the spec itself, but how the product can, can emotionally and can functionally uh, really push people to live in a, in a different way, a slightly better way. And I mean, I think that there has always been this chicken and egg problem between, uh, you know, city design and types of vehicles like the ones that you're actually making. And it's usually been uh, that people will go, OK, well, I would want one of those vehicles once the infrastructure has changed. But the problem with that is that the infrastructure is absolutely not going to change unless there are options to go on those streets. So having a vehicle that's really designed for this use could lead to people going like, hey, I actually saw one of those driving down the street the other day. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a special little cut through since it's not going to disturb the neighborhood to have a little street doesn't have to be as wide as a normal street. It could be designed uh, cheaper and easier and it would allow people to get around. You're absolutely right. I think I'm really glad that you brought this up because it is a chicken egg problem looking from the outside. But I think the way to crack it is really through our choices. Um, It's the same with electric cars. You know, you know, there weren't charging infrastructures and the vehicles. And in the beginning, they weren't that good, to, to be honest, uh, weren't that competitive. 
but there are always pioneers who, uh, by pioneers, I really mean uh, the consumers and people like you guys pushing these kind of uh, this industry forward is that there are always people who, because they believe in the mission and believe in the potential that this can can do, that they go on and 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 try these products or they invest in companies like Tesla and they invite invest in uh, renewable energy and in that way, you know the the city the world has to respond to that kind of uh, demand and passion to really make this work. Yeah, so the world was really never built for. Either cars or horse carts, either. But because people use them, that there are infrastructure that that are built for、uh, that comes after that, right? So it's really by people's choice that you can really change a lot about、um, how the city is designed and the the infrastructure around the the products. So you're absolutely right on that. And I mean, I think that a lot of people might be thinking, you know, they're sitting in their suburban or more rural homes, and they're going, "Okay, city slickers will always get the, you know, neatest little thing." But you talked about、uh, Peachtree, Georgia, and that is not a bustling metropolis. That's a pretty、uh, wide open, I would say, you know, suburban、yeah. space, right? Yeah, it weren't really a.、Um... It's not a typical early adopter community, but I think people were、uh, really using golf carts be- not because it's something that looks cool or fa- flashy, just because they actually have a very functional purpose of being very versatile. You can get in and and out, and once people try it, you know, in that community, they tried it and they see their neighbors were driving it. They something sort of clicked, and they think. Oh wow! This is. I don't really have to drive to、uh, drive my SUV to just go to a, somewhere three miles away, right? And it can just be something as simple as a golf cart. And the more people drive it, and the more、um, the community is more friendly towards it.、Uh, and it's kind of like how European cities are becoming more walkable is because people choose to to bike more, and people choose to. Uh, people are actively choosing alter- alternatives other than driving a bigger cars.、Um, what really interests me from an investor point of view in this company is that、um, there's no problem having a niche vehicle. That's fine because there's so many people in the world. But I also see this as being bigger than niche because I think that you've hit on something.、Um, having a golf cart, we already know works, right? We've already proven that. All the warm climate places, people like them. But when you get into the colder climate places, people don't generally drive around in golf carts. Well, what you've solved here with the zero is that you've made a car that is small, like a golf cart. It has all those advantages. Yet it doesn't use lead acid batteries. It uses new technology. It uses lithium ion, so you've got better range. And so now、uh, here, you know, up in Massachusetts, in this cold, you know, we're six months out of the year. It's cold. We could conceivably have a zero because it does everything we need. We could comfortably get to the store and to all of our Neighborhood places in comfort. Yeah, I, I'm a huge bike fan, so I love bikes. I love e-bikes and scooters as well. But those products, they, they aren't really that suitable to American cities、uh, and a lot of communities. I mean, people are more open up to them now because of the COVID. But、uh, I think they have their limitations in terms of weather, in terms of、um, range, and. Uh, majority of trips are between one to ten miles, and a lot of those last mile options are perfect for two miles or less. And a lot and cars, passenger cars, are perfect for ten miles. If you're going further than ten miles, maybe it, it's worth the 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 trouble of finding a place to park and being in traffic、um, and and all that. But but Eli there is built for between perfect for. One to ten miles, for example. So that's seventy percent of urban trips. So it's just like what I. It, it is. It seems like a niche market right now because the existing products are sort of、uh, positioned as such. But I think the the potential is exactly the sort of the metaphor that I used as the iPad of cars.、Uh, if conventional cars were laptop, that it, people initially they don't really. Can't see clearly the use case, but once they get their hands on, it, and once you start seeing these vehicles on the streets in cities, they will 
instantly understand, wow, most of the trips can actually be carried by these kind of vehicles. It actually makes sense. And potentially this is as big of a mar market as highway cars, um, meaning cars built for highways, right? Um, so I do think in my vision for a future cities, I really see Eli Vero cars like Eli Vero to be at the center of um, cities and passenger cars to be at the peripheral, uh, periphery of, of the cities on highways. Um, they can be autonomous, you know, they can be um, r robot taxis, but Eli Vero will be at the center of a vibrant, walkable city. So that's sort of our, our vision for for not just the future and for our product as well. One of the biggest expenses in the United States, one of the hidden costs of car ownership, um, whether it be for the actual consumer or, well, I guess it always comes back to the consumer, but is parking. So you go to the mall, you go to the store, um, that mall or store has to have parking usually, and it costs them quite a lot to both build that parking lot, maintain it, uh, and especially here in the north to plow it, keep everything, you know, repaint the lines and everything like that. How much smaller, like how many more Eli's could you fit in a typical, you know, parking? I don't want to say parking space because maybe you need, you know, three spaces. But, you know, how much more compact could you make a parking lot if only Eli's were parking there? Yeah, the quick answer is three. Yeah, you can fit three Eli Theros in a parking lot. And, and you're absolutely right. It's from the consumer perspective, it's a, it's a really cost, costly part of car ownership. But from the urban perspective, from the community perspective, parking space is actually one of the, the biggest waste of resources, of a waste of valuable urban um, resources. So you have a lot of these vacant parking lots partially uh, occupied, but you have to build them just because everyone is driving a big car and, uh, and they take up enormous amount of hidden space in cities and buildings and uh, in public. They could have been beautiful parks, but you know, because you need that space, they are turned into parking lots. Now, in terms of who can drive these vehicles, I mean, they only go 25 miles an hour and they're a lot smaller than most vehicles. Does this open up any new drivers to this style of vehicle in the U.S. specifically? In the U.S. specifically, I think it's very similar to car driving. You need a license plate and you need a uh, driver's license for this type of vehicles. But in Europe, they're doing something really interesting. They're encouraging people to drive these vehicles and making. So in certain countries like France, they call it license free cars because certain age groups don't do not need license, uh, driver's license to drive these cars. So they are very appealing to, you know, some people because, you know, it's kind of the, it's very easy to drive these around. And because of the speed limit, you know, it's less, um, it's less likely to cause harm to both the driver and to the passenger, uh, to uh, the pedestrians. Yeah, I can imagine I mean, sending your kid to school in France in one of these because it's safer. And by safer, I mean, when you're on a bike on most, you know, European or American roads, you're just invisible, like no one sees you. But when you're in a vehicle, a four wheeled vehicle, the visibility goes way up. And so much harder for, an, you know, an accident that would kill someone on a bike to happen in a vehicle like this. Yeah. And you have compared to scooters, you have and, and to e-bikes, you also have seatbelts and you have an enclosure uh, and you have visibility. Absolutely. Um, so and you have four wheels. Like with a bike, I, you know, part of the worry is that, like, if I if I tilt too far one way, I'm going to fall over. Um, and yeah, that's you know, I don't even have to hit anything because I'm going to hit the I'm going to hit the ground in uh, the same with a scooter. But, yeah, when you're in a vehicle that's actually stable, you don't have to worry about it. So then going to the other uh, end of the spectrum, so to speak. What about older communities? People who, you know, you don't want grandma driving a big SUV anymore. We've seen too many things on the news where, you know, oh, that's, yeah. I thought that was the brake pedal and they drive through the, you know, the storefront. I assume in an, in an Eli, it's going to be a little bit less, uh, dangerous if you mistake one pedal for the other, right? I mean, it's just a smaller vehicle. The uh, senior communities, they love these kind of products. They love golf carts, um, and, but a lot of them, they buy golf carts because it doesn't have AC, it doesn't have enclosure. They have to buy these drapes and they have to build these doors for themselves. But what they're trying to 
to build is a product like Eli, right? Uh, it's something that has enclosure, has AC, but um, the senior communities like the village in Florida, uh, there are tens of thousands of these cars in one single community. And the reason people drive it is because they have all these facilities inside the community. So it's really easy to just, um, they have, you know, a couple golf courses and different tennis courses and they have their own movie theaters and uh, with with and dining options all within the community. So in certain senior communities, it's actually not allowed to go in with a car. So you have to drive these uh, these NEVs. So these are definitely markets that we think it's quite inspirational how people you know get around in these and they they, they seem so happy just not having to drive a bigger car. Um, and, and it's also cleaner, it's also less noisy, um, and does not have emissions. So that's definitely a very interesting market, an existing market. But uh, yeah, we think uh, the, I, I, we think this should not be limited to just senior communities and certain golf cart communities or beach towns. I think this can actually be uh, adapted by a lot of um, bigger cities as well. Well, there's even one aspect that would make it even easier, and that is charging. Yeah. What is it like to charge an Eli? That's a really great question because, um, like I said, Eli is very energy efficient and it does not have to power because it's so lightweight and so compact. A lot of the energy does not go to waste of carrying its own weight. For Eli, uh, for the uh, 8 kilowatt hour version that can go uh, up to 70 miles, it only needs to charge three and a half hours through a uh, 220 volt home plug. So that's actually really fast comparing to conventional cars. I think it takes, you know, more than 12 to 24 hours to charge on a 220 volt because it's, you know, it's too, it's too low for them. But we think it's very important that it, that it does not need any special infrastructure to be able to use it um, like you normally do. So I think, to be able to charge it for the six kilowatt hour version, we, we only need two and a half hours to charge on a 220 volt level one uh, plug. So it has six kilowatt hours in it. Yeah, yeah. Even my Leaf, which has pretty much the same range that we are talking about, it has a 22 kilowatt hour battery pack. And you know, while it charges a lot quicker than my Tesla, to have an eight or six kilowatt hour battery, I mean, the infrastructure can be so much smaller, can be so much more manageable that I think that it's going to be a lot easier to adopt in, uh, you know, if you're on a planning board, it's like, okay, we could either have two big EV chargers or we could have, yeah. you know, six, 10, uh, you know, you could have a whole station devoted to charging Eli's uh, because it's really not that much power mm -hmm. and it's super convenient because if you, if you plug it in for just a couple hours, you're going to get quite a bit of range. You're absolutely right. And for um, a lot of these golf carts, they're, you know, they use um, lead acid batteries and are, are under four to five kilowatt hours, but people get by them. They just charge it, plug into their home plug and they wait, you know, a couple hours or over overnight and they're able to use it within their communities. They charge it probably every couple of days and they're able to use it pretty fine, pretty well. So um, it, it is very a, di a little different from conventional cars because you're very dependent on fast charging on special infrastructures for electric cars. But you never really see people driving these golf cars. They think of themselves as electric car drivers just because they think it's sort of no brainer to, to charge a, a golf car but they don't really think of it as a electric car just because, you know, they're not really plugging into a supercharger. They're just plugging into their, their uh, household plug. That's something that we, we also learn from the beauty of um, sort of e-bikes and the beauty of golf carts and electric scooters is that you need to make it really home friendly, meaning that you can charge it from a household outlet and still be able to get really high efficiency on, in it. I want to ask about yeah. autonomy. Yeah. Um, I noticed in your videos that you show the Eli driving itself. Is that something in the future you're planning on doing? Yeah, so we have a version of Eli that's built on completely uh, drive-by-wire platform. And so that's uh, our platform 
um, is capable of complete drive-by-wire, which is the foundation for uh, self-driving. And self-driving, the autonomy, the control part of the autonomy is something uh, on top of the, the drive-by-wire uh, foundation architecture. But um, I think that's something we're very fascinated by. And we actually talked to uh, more than one uh, self-driving companies about uh, interest in operating a vehicle like Eli because in low speed environment, you know, the autonomous driving is, is not really a problem. It's completely, it's almost completely solved uh, in terms of functions and safety and, and reliability. It is the difficult thing about autonomous driving is really on highways, uh, uh, really at uh, a high speed in, in, in cities. If you cap the speed, you can really achieve a pretty uh, commercially viable product. And that's something we're definitely very interested in. But our current focus is really just get Eli there on the roads to people and um, to have it um, have a certain scale where we can develop really cool features and new business cases on top of our existing platform and uh, existing fleet of vehicles. So I guess my final question, and this is the one that uh, I see a lot of companies fail at, is the growth phase. Um, it seems like you're doing mm -hmm. everything right right now. You're getting the product out and you're actually getting a physical real product out, not just a CGI one. Yeah. Um, so that's great. But then I see a lot of companies kind of stutter at this point where they've they don't know what to do next. And so I'm wondering, what are, what are your plans for the next few years? How are you going to grow this company? If I'm going to invest in your company, am I going to be sure that, you know, Eli is going to be there in five years and is selling a lot of cars? How are you going to do that? Yeah, so we, Eli Vero is our first um, product, but we really think of micro EV as a space where um, it's very interesting because the product, the EVs themselves are more like electronic products than conventional cars. I know with um, the high-speed passenger EVs, they all talk about it being an electronic appliance, but um, I think micro EVs are, are more like a fridge than a Tesla does. So, and it's also a heavily platform-based product. So we're not just developing uh, Eli there, we're also, we also built a micro EV platform where we're going to develop very exciting different, a range of product from it. So besides these new products, we're, we're also looking into new business models of exactly what we talked about, um, the possibilities of with autonomy, with, uh, with modular platforms, but these are something uh, that is coming at a later stage when we have a fleet of vehicles. Uh, so that's something that we're very interested in. And uh, the ceiling is very high for, for growth for this uh, vehicle category because it's such a early stage right now and they can barely see the kind of vehicle. They don't even have visibilities for this kind of vehicle on the street. So we think our first step is really to push it, to have visibility for for micro EVs, and then we can grow more uh, new business models and new products um, and uh, new revenue streams from there. That's great. Well, I think we should confer right now and see if we're going to invest in this company. I don't know. What do you think of that? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm really wow, excited. Wow, the suspense. <laughs> <laughs> we should have kept you hanging a little longer. I think it's been obvious yeah. through this uh, conversation that I really am excited. I mean, I love new EV startups, but um, what we really have seen is that there's been a lack of companies like yours that really are getting into a unique space. They all seem to want to come up with another Tesla. And while that's great, uh, Tesla's already doing it and probably doing it better than most can do it. Right. Um, you're getting into a new, you're making a new product basically that I haven't seen before um, and you seem to be doing it the right way. So I'm going to be a happy investor in your company. Wow, I appreciate it, Dak. Yeah, that means a lot actually. You know, I think for us at this stage, um, all these supports from our start engine investors and uh, like I said, the main purpose of the, because we're only raising one million so far, um, the the purpose is is both financial, but also to reach out to a community and to have to really give the uh, give people a way to participate with us. And it's sort of uh, constantly having a, 
a group of people cheering on you, your success, while we're really just focusing rather sharp on the product, on um, putting the vehicles onto the street. And I think this is a really exciting time for us because this is exactly the time where we're pushing these vehicles on the street. We've been developing our product for quite a while, and but a lot of work, like I said, are behind the scene. But this is a really amazing moment for us to to get feedback from people like you and people like our investors on Start Engine. That's a really good point. I mean, I'm part of some angel syndicates. And one of the things that like Jason Calacanis talks about a lot is that when you get in as an angel investor, um, you're not supposed to bug the CEO all the time, give him phone calls, but um, you can help the, the company a lot because you can, um, you know, introduce them to new opportunities and new markets. And you can also help them find bugs in their software or bugs in their, you know, websites. And you can, you can give them that kind of help that uh, they really are looking for because you are, you want the company to succeed and you have opportunities they may not know about. Right. And well, to that point, I yeah. mean, the, all the people who usually reach out to us and are saying like, what can I do to help electrify my city or town? I don't know. It's a great tool in the toolbox of a city planner to say, uh, well, here's one thing we could do. We could take, you know, that four lane street in our town that does not need to be four lanes, devote one of the lanes to uh, neighborhood electric vehicles. And now you could get, you know, all the way from the neighborhood to the downtown. And that can make a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. So the possibility for American cities to become more efficient, more friendly is uh, there's a lot of potential in there because you have these great, you know, high density cities and very vibrant was uh, with commercial activities and, and life, life um, and various type of, uh, of life uh, activities in there. But I think it does take um, a new approach to how you get around these cities to, um, to, to make them truly great and make them a uh, potential uh, scene. So I think uh, part of Investing in Eli, ho hopefully, is also investing in better future for cities. Well, you heard it, folks. If you're interested in getting in with Jesse and I on Eli, uh, head on over to smartengine.com slash Eli. You can become an investor, too. Thank you so much, Marcus, for joining us today, sharing you know what your company is all about. I'm really excited about the future of your company, and I hope you'll come back and join us soon and tell us when you're shipping to the U.S. and so forth. Like Jesse said, I would love to be one of the first to get in an Eli and show our viewers you know, what it's all about. Yeah, I will absolutely let you know. Yeah. Thank you for having me again. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Disruptive Investing. Be sure to like the video and subscribe. Click the bell button to be notified when new videos come out.